This is the GameStreet.biz microcast for Monday the 11th of March 2024. I am James Batchelor, Editor-in-Chief of GameStreet.biz and I'm joined today as ever by Chris String, Head of GameStreet.biz. Chris, um, busy week for you diving into charts numbers, which to be fair I know puts you in your element. Ah, it's a joyful, joyful time of the month when I'm going through the GSD and GFK figures and, and, and seeing what's doing well. Which is Hell Divers, by the way. Hell Divers is doing well. Hell Divers doing well. Good. Yeah. I had that, that hadn't come across. No, it's it's brilliant to see that doing doing so well. Like it's its first kind of yeah. major, major. I know we had Pal World before, but our, our first like major hit of the year from like a an established studio, established brand, yeah. etc. Pal World so. data isn't in the charts because there is, yes. you know, the charts are only um, uh, the bigger companies, and we talked about this in the previous podcast, but. Um, uh, so obviously that would probably be in there as well. But Hell Divers, Skull and Bones didn't do so well. Um, not initially anyway, and um, we haven't had a great start for Suicide Squad. I think that's been quite public. Um, uh, I'll be honest, there's games that have done a lot worse. Um, but um, but yeah, it, it's, not been a, it's not been a great month for those games. But in a year, this time last year, February had Hogwarts yeah. last year, and it was phenomenally successful. And really, the, gate, the market to be only down a little bit compared to this. Like, that's, that's not, that's a, I take that. Let's, um, let's, yeah, um, no, it's, it, it's impressive. Like you said, like it's, it's only down like five point five percent is what I read. I think. Yeah, for the UK, like, I've, I'm still doing UK, Europe. Um, and Sakana estimates that we'll be down about what ten percent at best this year. And I, I yeah, I, I can't disagree with that. I think um, it's going to be but one like, of those years. As you say, that's not bad in comparison with the um, with the the you know, the Hogwarts launch. And then like I think it was the Elden Ring launch was the February before. So like <laughs> Februarys have been you know been huge the last couple of years. So for to have a quieter February. Uh... Well, Sakana were doing that's their estimate for the full year will be a decline, right. and that's partly because there's no blockbusters, and it's because you know the consoles are maturing, and um, there's not that something influx of new stock driving sales mm. up so we expect hardware sales to fall there aren't that many massive games it's obviously an opportunity for everyone else yeah. um, but it is but it means that the numbers won't necessarily look great um but you know if a few hell divers too like this you never know one might Absolutely. get not far off i think on the next one um, a lot of people are looking forward to is dragon's dogma too i think that one stands well i don't know off. if they're looking forward to it out of like i, I don't know if in a in last year they'd have looked forward to it like it, no. I'm not saying they're not. I'm not saying they wouldn't have looked forward to it. Like people like Dragon's Dogma, but it, it's it's. I don't know if it would be up there with one of the most anticipated games if there was anything else out. There. No, that's true. Um, so um, so yeah, but yeah, it's a great opportunity for Capcom. Mm, I think anyone absolutely. that's got a big game coming out in the next or a big game by that in their minds in the next uh, twelve months will have a chance. A good chance. Yeah. You got to. You've you've got to be. Yeah, uh, they're, they're all quite hopeful. Like, I, I spoke to um, Bananamco's uh, Heavy Hod. On uh, oh. about uh, unknown, unknown nine, uh, yeah. unknown nine awakening, the new like action adventure, but it's like a whole transmedia thing around it. Um, and I asked, like, you know, the fact that this is coming out in the summer and there's not as much coming out in 2024 in general. And uh, yeah, he, he, his words were, I think his words were literally, um, I can only be happy that there's not more competition because yeah. that's the sort of game that would get overlooked. I know, yeah, we don't know how one that, well that one's going to perform, but that's the sort of yeah. game that absolutely would we, get drowned out by other We've talked about things. this. We've talked about this in the last few podcasts, haven't we? So, um, well, yeah. and we had Thomas and Remy talking. And it, the thing is, because there's not a lot out generally, it means even if your game doesn't have a great launch, it might it might find an audience a little bit later with through sales and activity mm. and DLC, and, and we're seeing that now with like you know we saw. Alan Wake's done 300,000 units in January, uh, which was, you know, or I think it's probably their biggest month. Yeah. And um, um, uh, uh, we saw the Immortals of Avium article. They said that they've had their best sales between December and January as well. So it's because things got quieter. And I think if the thing, but so yeah, opportunity for smaller devs. Um, yeah. But I, the overall, the numbers aren't going to look wonderful. Last tangent. I do wonder. You said about the uh, the long tail sales. I do wonder if that um, will apply to Skull and Bones, because obviously, like, came out, didn't launch particularly well, and then a month later, Sea of Thieves is coming to PlayStation, which yeah. is like the closest competitor. So, and it, I, I, anecdotally, like, it's been doing the rounds over the weekend that, um, like, uh, Sea of Thieves is the most pre-ordered game on PlayStation Store at the moment. So, like, yeah, at the top of the pre-orders good. charts, and uh, <laughs> that to me is still just hilarious. Seeing like an Xbox game. An Xbox. Well, I, I've said this before. A yeah. rare game on PlayStation. I'm not sure rare I can cope with yeah. this. Um, but the, uh, <laughs> but the um, uh, uh, yeah, I, Sea of Thieves. Um, as much as Sea of Thieves and Skull and Bones are both pirate games, right? And and I did compare them in the UK charts. Seventy five percent bigger launch um, Sea of Thieves had. Um, what I will say is, um, 
uh, they are quite different. Games. They are very, very different, very yeah. different target de- demographic, yeah. very different kind of mechanics. So yeah, yeah. but it just it's just Battle of the Pirate Games is just it, it, we can't help with journalists. We can't help but draw conclusions where you know comparison. Sorry, where where we want to. Uh, yeah, I'm um, Skull and Bones won't be happy. There's another pirate game on the market no. um, look, that looks similar. Will we'll, uh, we'll have similar marketing and stuff attached to it? But they are yeah, yeah. Oh. It, I, We'll have to see what happens with it um, if Ubisoft support it long term um, or if um, they write it off. We'll see. Let's talk about some news. Um, biggest stories of the past week. Uh, we've got three of them here. Last week was surprisingly busy news wise. Mm-hmm. Like I think we went into um, the, 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 part, the microcast with Thomas last week thinking like, well, we've got a few things we can talk about. And then this week I was like, I was, this morning I was like, hang on, we've got to talk about that. We've got to talk about this probably should talk about that there's a few other things we could have done um we've narrowed it down to three so let's crack on um first one i want to come bring up is the ongoing scuffle between epic uh sorry apple epic games and the european union so very short version because i honestly can't get into the war of words at this time of the morning um is apple banned uh, or, or blocked epic games's developer account which means it would not be able to release um, Fortnite on iOS again and it wouldn't be able to launch its own app store, uh, which has been enabled by the European Union's Digital Markets Act that has now forced Apple to open its ecosystem to other app stores. Um, there were, I can say, war of words. There were many, many words, but the words verifiably untrustworthy were two of the words used by Apple. I can kind of see why, but we'll get onto that in a second. Um, Epic obviously complained, a lot of kind of um, grumbling. EU... Uh, so the European Commission then reached out to Apple to uh, request further explanations behind this decision. And a day later, Apple, uh, well, Epic reported that Apple has reinstated or is reinstating its developer account. So plans for Fortnite to return to iOS and the Epic Game Store are moving forward. The conversation around this has kind of evolved beyond. This is not just an Apple versus Epic thing that's been going on since 2020. This is more Apple versus the EU. And Apple is trying its absolute damnedest to, technically comply with the Digital Markets Act but still kind of have as much control over its ecosystem as possible we've already talked about charge them all the extra tax exactly yeah the extra charge is like yes you can you you can launch an an alternative app store on ios but we'll be taking a 17 percent charge of all commission you know all transactions thank you very much and if your store uses our it wants to use our apple payment system that's another three percent charge thank you very much and yeah so apple's the the black the block against apple uh, sorry the block against epic the one point I can kind of see, like when they're like verifiably untrustworthy and all the these yeah. kind of harsh Epi- words. Epic are a pest. Epic are a pest. From Apple. No, no, not to the industry, but to, no. to Apple. They're an absolute pest, right? Yeah. yeah. In the first place, they made the moves uh, we're talking about back in 2020 when they allowed people to buy Fortnite stuff at a discount through yeah. their own store. I mean, they did, well, they that, did that. That they was did a that to provoke a reaction. Yeah. Yeah. It was that a, was a breach of a developer agreement. Like you're, it, you've got a company who has proven they're going to do breach your development agreement because they've done it before they've taken you to court over it saying they're justified to breach your agreement i can understand why and that and that you know it may not have been the only reason but it's all no. helped lead to the dma in the first place a digital markets act in the first place and then you've got and suddenly and suddenly apple are sort of this you know people you know, it's tim sweeney's quote malicious compliance around this um uh dma in in a sort of implementation and then epic's got and then apple got annoyed of epic over it Beautifully. I mean, Epic must be sitting there going, you fell for this beautifully, <laughs> right? And then they blocked their developer account and Epic just made that public, which have got the European Commission to come and look at them again, right? And, yeah. it's, it's, this, and it's this legitimately like, uh, they, Epic, are, uh, are, they just want to be a real nuisance to Apple and they are successfully being it. And I, I'll be honest with you, I'm surprised Apple, <clears throat> I'm not sure Apple, <clears throat> I feel it, I was surprised, it felt stupid to me to block the account out of what yeah. feels like spite in a bit. That's um, it. He d- did come across as a very kind of petty move. So Rob Farhi, our uh, contributing editor, wrote a whole kind of column on this on um, Apple's attitudes and why this is like, like I said, like much bigger than just Epic, uh, Apple versus Apple. Apple versus Epic. Good lord, I can't handle words this morning. Um, that this is more about Apple versus EU and the kind of the Apple constantly trying to find ways of complying, but without complying. And yeah, they're going to lose this. Like, I don't know but, what they're playing at, right? No, I <clears throat> I'll be honest. I, I think this is. I think this is. Uh, Apple have always had a bad reputation in the games industry, right? I know mm. that they've got the platform that makes loads of money for developers, and everyone's and they've, they've been broadly okay with it. And Apple Arcade was a cool thing when they did it. I know they sort of scaled it back a bit, but the um, Apple's. Everyone always thought Apple don't care about games. Mm. Games are a means to help them sell their hardware. 
And that's been a perception. Whether that's true or not, that's how the industry's always felt towards Apple. They've always said it. They, they've never really been accepted as a games company. They've always been seen as like just, a, they just own, a, they're just like, they're, they're not really, they're just like Dell isn't a games company, right? It's, they don't really, they're just over there. They don't really like games, but you know, they've got a platform that's quite popular for it. So game developers don't like them, but at least they're not warm to them anyway. And then to do this, and it's, it's, it's I, just, yeah. I just have to think, I just, I do, you just, they're just playing the villain. And, um, and I, I, they need to, they're going to lose, right? This is the thing. They will eventually be forced, you know, globally to open up their platform in a way that they're not comfortable with. And I, yeah. rather than, rather than being a, you know, work, make it work for you, right? Work, but here's the thing. Microsoft didn't want to open up its platform either with Windows. And look where they are now, right? Mm. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be, um, doing this doesn't have to lead to, um, it might be some short term pain, sure, but it doesn't have to be. It could it could open up opportunities long term for Apple, and I and I'm just a bit, I just sort of fed up with them. I, I just <laughs> I, I just think to stop. So it. is Epic from the sounds of it. Yeah, and it, it, <laughs> every, 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 no, everyone loves the everyone's a bit. I think there's a few people in the industry who's a bit like oh, Epic are why is it why you know it's like they, Epic can afford to be it. They're massive. They're independent. They can they can they can yeah. they can afford to be a real nu- nuisance, and it's. I, Love them or hate them, I kind of like them um, <laughs> for what they're doing. But um, but yeah, I just I think it's about just just embrace the, yeah. the 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 reason why this is happening is because you've been so successful and um, find use it as a means to you know to spark on. We all know how much competition is good for markets and how it's good for individual businesses as well. So mm. I, I'm just a bit. Um, as you say, it, it, yeah. it's going to change. Like you know, the the conversation globally is changing over walled gardens, particularly on things like mobile, which is kind of such a ubiquitous device. That never, you know, everyone uses mobile. Like it's not, it, it's quite it's general purpose hardware, isn't it? It's not like a you know, walled gardens. I think are still going to exist on consoles because they are a dedicated hardware for a dedicated purpose, i.e., gaming and to an extent entertainment. Whereas smart devices are used for so damn much like this obviously is happening in the eu with the digital markets act but you know apple is still facing changes in the us so the apple versus epic the actual court case the ruling and stuff all all got sorted out uh, kind of just before christmas and yeah like all all appeals have failed the original ruling stands and apple does now need to enable um third party payments or direct payments but again they've done it where they enable it but they take a 27 percent charge on any transactions made through alternative, uh, alternative links. So like it's, again, it's it's still kind of clinging to all that kind of control and revenue it can, and it's 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 fighting against the tide. And yeah. I, I'm I'm intrigued to see what other markets kind of EU and US two massive markets, obviously. Yeah, in terms of when, once Apple's those business, once but... markets that size have started doing, yeah, it, you sort of if everything tends to fall in line. Um, I'm um, I'm, yeah, I, I'm just I don't know. I, I, if I worked for Apple, I'd be sitting there going, "Goodness sake!" <laughs> it's just like it's. I know, I know. It's it's money and it's revenue and it's and it's you know your ecosystem that you've built and you've supported. But there comes a point where you've it's become it's become bigger than you. So yeah. you know, embrace it rather than fight it. Anyway, they'll they'll lose eventually. They will lose eventually. Um, speaking of losing, um, we move on to our next story, which is uh, the Nintendo and Yuzu. Um, legal legal dispute um so uh, tropic hayes the creator of the switch emulator yuzu um has not so much lost that was a terrible segue they have settled they've agreed to a settlement with nintendo um so nintendo took legal action against the um the company tropic hayes the tropic hayes employed some lawyers because when nintendo lawyers are knocking down on your your door you better have some lawyers to answer them uh, and they have agreed to pay $2.4 million in a settlement to Nintendo. Uh, they've agreed to give up the domain name um, to Nintendo of America. They've deleted all of the circumvention tools that they had for their program. Uh, this is not f- just affecting Yuzu. Uh, this is also affecting, uh, d- affecting Citra, which is a Nintendo 3DS simulator. Um, and yeah, th- this all turned around quite quickly. Like I think it's been a, the, the space of a week between Nintendo was going after Yuzu Nintendo and Yuzu have settled. Like, it, it was quite a quick turnaround. The conversation around this has become a lot kind of broader. Like, it's... We were saying just before on, on air, there's a lot of conversation about how litigious Nintendo can be and how, how harshly... It, how, how aggressively it goes over emulators. But the one point people can see quite reasonable is in this instance, 
Yuzu was emulating a cu- its current active console. Like it wasn't um, emulate. It's harder to to kind of fight against. Um, you know, emulators for things like Game Boy, N64, etc., because the argument can always be made for preservation. And it's a very kind of legal grey area around, you know, emulation and whether it's allowed for preservation purposes. You're not preserving The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom if people are able to download it a week before release, you know. Um, so it's a very kind it's of different a really, thing. It's a really more... Because also even the 3DS bit, you could argue, is preservation. But Nintendo yeah. are rolling out all of its games onto a subscription service. And, you, can, you know, it's like... I mean, obviously, that's not the same as preserving... But then it, that's, you know, it's complicated. But um, look, Nintendo are going to fight. Look, I was there. I wrote extensively about the Nintendo R4 card, right? Mm. And I think we forget how... It's interesting, not just Nintendo. I'll quickly mention PS2. I did a, a it with Jim Ryan. It was a little while ago. So the outgoing PlayStation CEO about um, their most, you know, will they ever top the PS2? And his view is like, we top the PS2 of every subsequent games console because we weren't hit by massive piracy right <laughs> and it was a really interesting to hear him say that because it was um you know the games weren't a lot of money they didn't make a lot of revenue off the hardware either and um and there's so, there's so much piracy on the device that you know ever since they've, they they ever since then that's they've enjoyed more success <laughs> but nintendo um uh the ds man that, and here's the thing that does impact consumers i don't think people realize the impact that had mm. on um gamers because um GTA Chinatown Wars, right, mm. was a, was actually a failure of a game. Amazing game, brilliant game, heavily promoted. And you could argue it was the wrong audience, it was the wrong platform. But the, I can't remember the exact number, but I'm pretty sure Nintendo told me it had been downloaded illegally 10 times more than it sold, right? It might have even been more than that. It might have been exceptionally more than that. I can't remember. And, it, and you're, okay, look, those aren't, all of those aren't sales. In fact, the majority of them won't be sales. People perhaps wouldn't have planned to buy it anyway. But the R four card was ubiquitous. You could buy it on Amazon. You could buy you it can on. Still, like, you can still buy them on Amazon. Brendan yeah. did a whole piece on this, like just before Christmas. Like Amazon is still openly selling or enabling people to sell R four cards, and like for DS and three DS, you can buy. Yeah, yeah. Well, but back then it was it was Amazon was selling it like through their own, <laughs> in their through them directly themselves. Yeah, and it was, and it was it's everywhere. Every every retailer, apart from maybe Game and some of the ones that are a little bit closer to Nintendo, were selling it. All the indie shops are selling it. It was um it was prevalent, and mm. if you're a, okay, maybe if you're more casual in on the DS, you didn't use it, but it meant that. And I did a I did a couple of chats. So Take Two said that they were they would evaluate future DS opportunities after Chinatown Wars, which meant they didn't do another game like Chinatown Wars on the DS. They didn't do another game like that on 3DS either. A couple of casual games, but they did not do that anymore. Mm. The second thing um, that happened is I had a chat with Square Enix, who were also severely impacted by R4 popularity and in their minds. And they said they were scaling back their DS support, right? So gamers actually got fewer games they would have got on their DS as a result of the R4 card. Even if, even if it turned out the R4 card didn't cost a single sale, the perception that it did, yeah. and I, I think it's hard to argue it didn't, but the perception that it did um, is, um, uh, was enough to put off games companies supporting that platform. Mm. And that's, that's a problem. So now Nintendo, every time it looks like something's bobbling up, it will come down with, but it's coming down on them because if they can make it difficult, if they can make it awkward for you to pirate, you know, they're never going to quite kill it off. They're never going to do that. But if they can make it as difficult and awkward as possible, mm. um, it will, it will basically, it, it will keep it, keep it being a niche. It'll keep it being something that um, people on, you know, hardcore gamers on forums do, mm. you know, it's easier just to loop like, up the eShop and if you oh, fine, I paid a 10 quid and get the thing. Right. So it, it's, it's, it's obviously the bigger games a little bit different. But yeah, Nintendo, I'm not surprised. But based on what happened with that DS and the impact mm. it had and the relationship the impact it had on their partners and actually the impact it had on the games that came out on it, um, uh, I'm not surprised. Nintendo, I think Nintendo will always fight it really, mm. really hard. And it's their job. Their job is not to stop it. No. Their job is just to make it a pain in the ass to do. <laughs> Nintendo, no, I, I agree. Nintendo's always going to fight against this. Um, and like, you know, Rob, again, Rob Maker wrote, wrote a great comment on, on the Nintendo user dispute and he, he argued quite convincingly that... Um, Piracy affects all companies in the industry and all platform holders in the industry, but Nintendo has perhaps been impacted the most. I mean, certainly most prominently, like, you know, the R4 cards, etc. Like, you know, they were so easy to get. Um, you know, Nintendo faces slightly slightly larger pro- problems with piracy and so forth, and they are more reliant on getting you into their ecosystem and, like, you know... <sighs> 
age old Nintendo, you know, fact thing, you know, factors, things like you know, the fact that first party hard you know, first party titles are the biggest sales drivers, so they need to protect those games from being pirated. The fact that um the you know the the this is almost I see this as almost catch twenty two. The value of Nintendo games so rarely drops. Like, you know, the Zelda's seventy quid maybe you'll see it drop to 60 or 50 in some sort of discount but you won't see it drop below, below that we've gone are the days of you know games dropping to there were there were times when you know most games used to drop to like 20 30 quid or like a few months after launch nintendo games never drop that low like i mean blimey even if you go to if you buy like um 3ds games or or wii u games or you know in in you know somehow like cax or something or even you know even launch launch games launch games for the switch are still full price now like it's those never come down and I that know. It's catch twenty two because like that kind of I think I imagine compels some people to piracy. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, but I mean it's, but the, partly, equally... it's partly the audience Nintendo goes for, right? So yeah. when people pick up a Switch, Mario Kart Eight is as new for them as you know. It's like it's, no, that's true. It's the yeah. way they um, it's the way they sort of uh, yeah, their games don't 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 devalue, don't drop in value. In fact, that's the reason why some of the other platform holders, some of the other companies, are not so rather well bothered about it um, in quite an aggressive way because. You know, oh, you're pirating our ten pound version of you know that sort of stuff. But it, it's it, yeah, Nintendo value sustainable. They're sustainable. They want, they're all about sustainability and you know, mm. um, growing steadily and protecting their IP. Because also, when you start when games start being emulated and people start editing them and all, and okay, it happens on mass. It's one of the reasons they're so cross on YouTube about how things are presented. Right? They don't want yeah. kids discovering Mario through uh, any means that's not controlled by them. But no, it's, there is a genuine concern about preservation. And here's the thing, it's really difficult conversation with Nintendo because Nintendo um, kind of rely on that back catalogue to continually bring in revenue for them all the time, right? They're constantly going, here's Mario again. Here's Mario. I think I own, I'm not joking, I think I own seven copies of Mario 64 if yeah. I have, over various different generations. Now I subscribe uh, to Nintendo Switch Online. I will hopefully won't need to buy it again for a while. However, I'm always giving Nintendo money on a monthly yeah. basis for it, or if it's a yearly basis. This, for this it. is so, until, this is until you find out that you, you know, Switch Two won't have the same Switch Online subscription. I would be shocked if they did that. I would I be know. absolutely shocked because the they haven't the, finished. They haven't all finished. those games. All those games we bought on Virtual Console and then had to buy them again on the next Virtual Console. But that's that's different because I'm yeah. still having to give yeah. them money for this. Like I'm not. It's not like <laughs> it's not like they thought. It's not like they're taking it away to have to buy it again. At least I understand why they would do that. Like they have to up, make it work on the new platform. Um, I I would be shocked if they. I wouldn't be surprised I, I, if Nintendo I, Switch Online in the future becomes something you can get on your phone. That would um, be cool. um, You know, retro Nintendo collection. Um, yeah, um, but see, that's that's one of those things that we say, and we know that that's a good idea, and people should, do, and that they should do it, and therefore Nintendo determinedly will not do it. They, they won't be in a hurry <laughs> to do it because it's added value for their platform. But yeah. like you know, their their controllers they've made for it. They work on PCs, right? So it's yeah, just starting yeah. to go. You know, is it that far fetched to think some of them might end up on a? You know, if Nintendo can keep your ecosystem, um, it's it's maybe not. I don't think it'll be anything We've... they do soon. We've veered into speculation, so I'm going to bring yeah. us to um, our final story before we uh, wrap up. Um, so the other thing a lot of people were talking about last week were comments by uh, Warner Brothers, specifically by uh, CEO and President of Global Streaming and Games, J.B. Perrett. Uh, this was during an um, earnings call around Warner Brothers Discovery's uh, results. Um, there were a few comments on the console market, so I'm going to read these verbatim. Um, he was talking about the the... The console business he was saying, the challenge we've had is our business historically in games has been very AAA console based. That's a great business when you have a hit like Harry Potter, it makes the year look amazing. And when you don't have a release, or unfortunately we also have disappointments, we've just released Suicide Squad this quarter which was not strong, it just makes it very volatile. Peret's answers to this uh, volatility are two things, or two main things. Is One is pushing more into mobile and multi-platform free to play games. Uh, which which could give us a much better and more consistent set of revenue. Um, he suggested that there's going to be more mobile free to play games uh, later this year. Uh, and the second was through live services. And this is the comment that a lot of people got, got quite uppity about. So rather than launching one and done console game, how do we develop a game around, for example, Hogwarts Legacy or Harry Potter that is a live service where people can come in and live and work and build and play in that world on an ongoing basis? Now, the timing of this comparison isn't marvellous. So, having just mentioned in almost the same breath Suicide Squad, a AAA live service game which has struggled at launch, and then suggesting they should go more in that direction than Hogwarts Legacy, which is not just the best-selling game of last year, 
but the first game that wasn't Call of Duty and wasn't a Rockstar title to top and the US if you go charts. back to the previous 12 months, it was Lego Star Wars The Skywalker Saga, which was one of the top three games selling games yeah. of the year, which is also a single-player story narrative-driven, and the big one, yeah. made by Warner Brothers. So they had two hits on the bounce, and yeah. They're not, here's the thing, they're not wrong, right? You know, no. if, if they can build something that, you know, you can have years, well, we don't have a big, you know, Take Two is a great example of it. I'm pretty sure they had a whole generation where they didn't release anything, but it was kind of okay because GT Online, uh, Red Dead Redemption 2. But um, uh, just to, to sort of um, uh, keep things sort of flowing for them, and obviously NBA and stuff, uh, I'm going too much into that Take Two, but that's an example of being, if you've got a big live service game, they can bring those sort of money in. And you look at a game like Harry Potter and you think, could we create a metaverse Potter game? But um, Brendan's opinion piece, by the way, is exactly what I feel about this. Warner Brothers need to play to the strengths of the things they've got, right? <laughs> like, if they've got, and here's the thing, what is even live service these days? Because here's yeah. the thing, I'd argue Hogwarts Legacy, Hogwarts Legacy one and done, still in the top 10 now. Right, it's not one done. It's still selling now, and it's yeah. a thing. It might even you know you're going to do an update, and you're going to expand it, and you're going to do more things on it, and it's going to keep selling. In fact, it's been in the charts consistently in the top ten, sometimes in the top, mostly in the top five. It's almost GTA levels of consistency. Okay, GTA has been going for eleven years now, yeah, but yeah. Um, but it, it's it's showing it's showing such legs. And uh, here's again, The Witcher kept selling and selling and selling mm -hmm. for decades after Skyrim. Now these games are big, epic, fantasy, role-playing experiences that people come back to and come back to, and they, and they spread and the audiences get bigger and bigger and bigger of each generation. Is that live service? That's not the live service they're talking about, is it? They're talking about free-to-play and microtransactions and monetization. They're not talking about yeah. a game that just sells and sells and sells and sells. But the results are the same. It's recurrent revenue from one invested product, one product that you've released. They've got Lord of the Rings, for crying out loud. Right? They've got yeah. the original fantasy epic, right? Build us an Elder Ring. Hang on, set. because Embracer owns Lord of the Rings, don't they? But don't, I thought they did have a... Am I, am I getting that? Ah, uh, no, hang on. I imagine Warner's got the rights to the, the film versions of Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. Yeah, Whereas so. the general and Tolkien rights are now Embracer-owned. Yeah, I might have looked into that. Um, but they, they've, got, they've got... But, <laughs> but yeah. they've, they've also got Harry Potter, right? Which I know they've done with Hogwarts Legacy. And it's like, these are the things that you can um, monetize. The art thing is, superhero comic books aren't built for live service <laughs> like i've no. seen it they tried it the avengers like massive triple a super talented development teams who are experts at this have tried it and they just went you know what actually this i don't think i don't think the the, the ip fits with the um um uh, the story element of the ip and it fits you might be able to get some cool character based stuff but um fits with this model you know i think you know superhero film games have to be 20 25 hour long it has to be spider-man 2 basically um <laughs> and um and I just, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a bit, um, uh, I'm a little bit when it comes to um, um, those sort of comments. Like, but they're not wrong though. They could do with recurrent revenue, I think, from it. It's just, I just. It's, mm. it, I think it was just a very oddly worded, an oddly worded comparison. And it, it comes at a time when, I mean, Suicide Squad has been a big part of this conversation, like conversation around, you know, whether or not live service or games as a service, like the business model itself is as reliable or as, as, as guaranteed a hit as, as some executives seem to think. Like there's a whole conversation about whether or not, you know, live services games are viable anymore because there's so damn many about them. And again, I'm recognizing that live service is a very kind of broad term, could mean anything at this point. Loads of people do mean it in different ways. But at a time when people are talking about like, you know, there's there's consumer resistance against some live service games it's incredibly challenging to bring out a new live service game or a new games as a service title um in a very very competitive market because people are still still playing gta online fortnite etc like for a, an executive to then be saying oh yeah we're gonna double down on this it just felt a little kind of not time deaf that's not the word but like kind of a little a little kind of oblivious to the actual challenges that are out there yeah so. yeah i well yeah it's it's, it's not easy right no. you know launching a, a live service game is not um is not it, it's really hard and you're competing in a market dominated by existing players and it's also it costs a lot of money um yeah. and um last thing i'd say it's at the, the risk of talking over you so sorry the last thing i say is like the, the ip is absolutely no guarantee of success like we saw this with avengers avengers at you know in the beginning an Avengers game seemed like a surefire hit. 
Um, or at least when it was first announced. But Harry Potter, like, I was convinced Harry Potter... I can't remember. I keep on calling it Harry Potter Go. Um, what was the Niantic's game? Yeah. Harry was. Potter Wizards Unite. Um, I was convinced that that was going to be hit. Like, you know, the only IP that could have been bigger than Pokemon for a Pokemon Go-style location-based game was Harry Potter died within two years. But that's because... Here's the thing. Pokemon Go, right? Pokemon yeah. Go, it is... Fu- it, it's Pokemon, right? And yeah. it's the thing. You play that game. Sure, it's 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 the the way you go out and your adventures and stuff. It's a little bit different. There's no story to it in the in the, in the exact same way. But it's mm. you catch a Pokemon, you train them up, you collect them all, you go to gyms. Like it's a Pokemon game. And they went, how do we put Pokemon in the real? And they used the, te- the it was a perfect example mm. of the use of the IP with technology and live service. I'm not saying they can't do it. It just I just and I understand they're investing in it. It's a shame if they don't, if they're investing, you know, if let's say they go, oh, Rocksteady, you need to make another live service game. And yeah. don't go, just make a Batman game. Yes. Um, you know, look, look at, make an open world Batman game. For, but do you know, Batman Arkham World. That'll do wonders, absolute wonders. It's a huge Absolutely, idea. Absolutely, yes. Um, but anyway. Equally, equally, it's going to be really weird if like Hogwarts Legacy 2 is more like Suicide Squad than it is like Hogwarts Legacy. But that's not necessarily what they're saying. No, no. Um, it, it's talk about future. It's also they're talking to shareholders. They want to say certain. Yeah. Things. By the way, I don't. I think I think Warner Brothers own the copyrights to the movies, but they don't actually. Yeah, right. Embrace own all the game stuff. So uh, you know, I, I they, they just ignore that. <laughs> In my moment of victory, I finally having proven Chris wrong on something after eighteen years of working together, or nearly eighteen years of working together, uh, we are going to wrap this up. Um, we're going to be back next week as always. Although no, you won't because you're going to be at GDC. Yeah, well, who knows? I might might be around. <laughs> You're gonna be, you cannot do the microcast jet lagged at three a.m. or whatever time is going to be there. I'm sure I could manage. I'm it. sure you could manage it. Okay, <laughs> right. We'll have this argument when we finish. Um, Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for watching. If you're on the YouTube channel, thank you so much for listening. If you're listening on the podcasting platform of your choice, uh, the podcasting platform of your choice is obviously where you can find all the previous microcasts and full episodes of the podcast, etc. Uh, we are going to be back next Monday. I will be. I don't know if Chris will be. We'll see. We're going to have that argument soon. And in the meantime, you can get more news, insight, and analysis into the world behind video games at gamesindustry.biz. 